And while you remain standing, if you have your scriptures, there's a word from the Lord today out of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. It's in your bulletin in the New King James Version. I'd like to read it from the New Living Translation, Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. It'll read a little bit differently than what you have in the bulletin, but at the end of the day, the truth is just the truth. And this is the word of the Lord. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And all the people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. We're beginning a new series of messages this weekend entitled, It's Time to Quit. The definition of insanity is repeating the same action over and over again, expecting different results. And if you have tried something over and over again and it's not really working, either fix it or stop it. Because it's only when we quit doing what doesn't work that we are able to discover the things that do. So today with the aid and assistance and anointing of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to quit underestimating the Lord. Now we're not touching the day, but you can tell your neighbor, say neighbor, quit underestimating the Lord. I'll explain. Here in our text, Mark is writing to a group of believers who are living in a difficult place in a threatening time. He's writing to believers living in Rome who were under pressure day in and day out. They were a double minority. They were Hebrews living in the Roman Empire first, and then secondly, they were newly dedicated followers of Jesus Christ. What Mark reveals as we read the story and as it unfolds up to this point is that Jesus had stepped onto the stage of human history proclaiming a message of good news, the message of the present and potent and potential kingdom of God. Jesus was speaking to an oppressed people for whom God had become a distant deity rather than a close relational reality. And yet as Jesus steps in the human history, he commenced and continued showing them through his words, his works, and his ways what happens when the kingdom of God is on the move. At the time of this particular text, Jesus is spreading the message even further. He is about to go into new territory. He is about to enter a new frontier. He is taking his disciples across the lake to a region that is both unfamiliar and quite uncomfortable. It is not Jewish land. They are not Jewish people there. It's new territory. And we get the impression that not only is he pointing them to new territory, in a physical sense, but alongside that, he is nudging them in the new territory spiritually as well. As Jesus leads his disciples and his followers into new territory, they begin to gather a journey, which they quickly discover is quite challenging and demanding spiritually, emotionally, and physically. We should all understand, ladies and gentlemen, that as Jesus extends the kingdom of God, both then and now, whenever and wherever the rule of God is expanded, whether it be in the human heart, in a family, in a community, or in a church, it will always entail a frontier at which there will be some struggle. 
Throughout scripture, these frontiers appear to be, seem to be guarded sometimes by difficulty, sometimes by confusion, sometimes by hindrances, and sometimes by outright enemy resistance and opposition. And we get an illustrated glimpse of this encounter in the text that we are teaching today. Let me reiterate that whenever and wherever God decides to lead a person, me or you, into new territory, whenever and wherever God decides to open up a new door, make a new way, create a new opportunity, or speak potential possibility or promise over an individual or over a community, the first things, the first events that often happen after that decision appear to be the exact opposite of what God has said. Joseph gets told that he is going to do great things, but first he ends up in prison. David is promised that he is going to be the next king, but first he has to endure years as a fugitive in the wilderness. The Hebrews are promised a good, lush, and fertile promised land, but first they have to battle the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Gergesites, and maybe even the Shilites, I don't know, who were living in that land. And in the same way, my brothers and sisters, it, it, when you and I are on a journey with Jesus Christ, we should expect there to be some struggle. He is leading us even now in the new places and spaces, new challenges and contests, new paradigms and possibilities, new adventures and new frontiers. It may be for you something personal, an area of growth in your heart or in your life. It may be an area of transformation. It may be concerning your job or your responsibilities, your family or your children. It may be your presence and participation participation in the community or in the church, but it is often the will of God to push us out of our comfort zone so that he can lead us in the new territory and the kingdom of God can be expanded. And often we discover to our dread and our dismay that as we go with the Lord, as we journey with Jesus, it will first take us through an unwanted, unanticipated, and unexpected storm. Lake Galilee in the text was known for its storms. They were often sudden, fierce, and incredibly chaotic. The theologian N.T. Wright notes that except for the fishermen among the Jewish people, they were not known to be seafaring, water-based people. They were people of the land, of the ground, of the earth. In fact, their cultural and spiritual heritage understood and portrayed the waters, the oceans, the rivers, the seas as symbols of the dark powers of evil that threaten God's creation, his people, his plans, and his purposes. In books like the book of Daniel, the sea is believed to have monsters in it. And so as these disciples ferry across the lake with Jesus, it's already a little daunting, but they have no idea about what is to come. But notice how it starts. It does not start chaotically. It starts with a calm instruction. Let the whole church say calm instruction. It's in verse 35. It says, that day when the evening was come, he, meaning Jesus, said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Now, in order to read this in its context, this signals a shift in the storyline because up to this point in the Gospel of Mark, the focus of the writer had been on the infinite wisdom of Jesus' teaching, but now he moves to the sovereign authority of Jesus' miracles. Jesus speaks a calm word of instruction. Let us go over to the other side. Can I paraphrase? I'm about to take you into a new territory. I'm about to take you someplace you have never been. I'm going to show you what you have never seen so that you can have what you have never had and become who you have the potential to become. 
Now, who wouldn't want that? But on the way to where they had never been, on the way to what they had never seen, on the way to what they had never had, on the way to who they had never been, they encounter a virulent, vicious, and violent storm. And the language here is similar to the Old Testament book of Jonah and that storm that took place there where the storm was unleashed and began to thrash against the side of the boat. It's dark, it's confusing, it's chaotic, and it's out of control. Now remember that I said at least seven of his 12 disciples were fishermen. They were seasoned in these waters, but this storm was too much for them. They knew that they were at the end of themselves, past their resources, past their strength, past their capacity, past their ability, because this, they recognized, was no ordinary storm. And remember, as I mentioned, that for the Jewish understanding and the Hebrew mind, the storms and the waters and the seas and the oceans were always a symbol of something deeper taking place. That was a lot on the line here. The mission of Jesus was on the line. The future of the kingdom of God was on the line. The people who would share the good news after he ascended into heaven, they were at stake. The lives that were being transformed, they were at stake. This territory into which they were adventuring together was guarded and appeared to be guarded by chaos and by difficulty. Can I talk to you for a moment? Because I wonder to what, my friends, has God called and invited you? I wonder what the word, the calm word of instruction before the storm was for you. How has the Lord led you in recent weeks, recent months, and recent years? Maybe there are frontiers in your heart, toxic emotions from which you need release, clandestine habits that siphon your energy and pick with your peace. Maybe God is doing a deep cleansing work in your character, working to transform you from who you've always been to who you have the potential to be, laboring to emancipate you from a yoke and incarcerated yesterday to a free and emancipated tomorrow. Maybe it's a frontier in your family where the Lord is calling you to forgive Uncle Charlie Nim and to release that grudge, to let go of that anger, to offer that apology, to rebuild, renew, restore, and reconcile. Maybe it's on your job where they are plucking your last good nerve. Maybe it's managing your money, your time, or your energy. Maybe it's pruning some of your relationships or irrigating the field of your associates. Maybe it's moving from viewership to membership to discipleship. I wonder to what God has called and invited you and you knew intuitively that God moving in your life was going to stretch you and if anybody had asked you you thought that you had enough to handle it that you were up for it and up to it until that storm broke out in your life See, it was the opposite of what you hoped it would be, the opposite of what you thought it would be, and you had no idea how tough it could be you, with all of your skill, all of your energy, all of your talent, and now you're at the end of yourself, and I, if you're honest, you're beyond the end of itself. Where has God been speaking to you recently as you have sought to journey with the Lord? What calm words? of instruction did he speak that suddenly abruptly and without preparation dropped you in the middle of a storm what has God been doing in you with you and for you that you had no idea was leading you to the storm that now surrounds you could it be that you too my friend are on the edge of something brand new 
that you're standing on the edge of a new territory, a new frontier, a new possibility, some new potentialities, a new opportunity where God is going to do something unexpected and unprecedented in and through your life. Because in case you walked up in here and didn't know it today, let me state what is painfully obvious. Let me name the elephant in the room. Here it is. Everybody has storms. There ought to be a better amen right there. My, my friend, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, who leads the Eastern Star Church, articulated this well. He said, some storms are meant for destruction, that God allows them to tear up some stuff. But some storms are meant for discipline, that God allows them in order to get his people right. But then some storms are meant for development, that God allows them because they're going to make you more than you have ever okay y'all ain't seeing this let me give you an example Hurricane Irma y'all remember Hurricane Irma it rolled through in September 2017 it devastated Puerto Rico and several other lands in the Caribbean it knocked out power knocked down houses flipped over cars took off roofs but one of the things you may not have read about that was also a part of that story is that in the British Virgin Islands, it took the roof off an entire prison and when it took the roof off, over a hundred prisoners went free and they haven't found them yet. Ooh, that went right over your head. The same storm that brought destruction for some brought deliverance for others. See, everybody has storms. Dr. Harry Wright, who used to be president of Bishop College in Texas, pointed out that all of us are either in a storm, just coming out of a storm, or on your way to a storm. And so since you don't know where your storm is, you better pay attention to this word today because it started with a calm word of instruction, but without warning, they were moved from calm instruction to a chaotic incident. It picks up in verse 36 where it says, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them, a furious squall, a terrible tornado, a, a, a vicious storm broke out and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped and here's a footnote Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion the calm quickly retreats into chaos because of changing circumstances and a sleeping Christ people are throwing up over the side of the boat they are fighting and crying and screaming and hollering and trying to find a way through and Jesus is asleep. Changing circumstances can create chaos in your life. There ought to be five witnesses right there. And yet Jesus is so confident in God's power and presence that he can rest on a pillow. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were going to make it to the other side of the lake. Why? Because he had a divine assignment on the other side. An assignment to confront and change a demon possessed man living in the cemetery mutilating himself engaging in all types of bizarre behavior but who would turn out to be a central figure in God's plan to expand the good news of the kingdom of God throughout the region of Gadaria and therefore since Jesus knew God had a plan a storm would never stop the Savior but the disciples were upset and up uneasy because Jesus was obviously unaffected notably uninvolved and painfully passive in the midst of all the chaos that they were going through now I don't know if you're that honest and I don't know if this is your story but I can identify with these disciples in the ship because I find those are the most vulnerable moments in my own life and in my own walk with the Lord. It's not necessarily when I feel the Lord is far away. It's when I know he is there but he just don't seem to be doing nothing. 
okay, y'all ain't that honest, amen. See, there's nothing like feeling helpless. There's nothing like feeling exposed and vulnerable. There's nothing like feeling powerless in a situation. It's so countercultural to how we like to live our lives. And it exposes something. And these disciples of Jesus, listen to it. They said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? These are the words of the desperate and the angry. Their sentiment is revealed in how they address Jesus. They don't call him Lord. They don't call him Savior. They don't call him Master. They call him teacher, a synonym for rabbi, a synonym in contemporary moments for how Baptists would talk to this pastor, Rem. Okay, I ain't got no Baptist here today. See, but remember, several of these disciples were fishermen who knew this lake inside and out. Jesus was a carpenter turned preacher. He was not a fisherman. What does Jesus know about the sea? Moreover, what can Jesus do in a storm? Pay attention to the details. Notice that they do not ask Jesus to do anything because they did not think he could. Y'all ain't ready. They concluded prematurely that this was beyond his wheelhouse. This was beyond his area of expertise. They completely underestimated the Lord. Their question was not, Lord, can you help? Lord, will you rescue? They asked, Lord, do you care? They didn't ask him to fix it. They didn't ask him to change it. They didn't ask him to stop it. They didn't ask him to to help us navigate through it they angrily ask do you care we about to drown we about to die and you trying to get some sleep you supposed to be a preacher ain't you can't you wake up read a scripture say a prayer give a benediction do something do that preacher stuff y'all do <laughs> see R.C. Sproul comments he said how like the creature to rebuke the creator their question is a rebuke which betrays their disbelief. Uh, Jesus, is this how it all ends? Is this what it was all for? All those miracles, all those sermons, all those parables. Is this how it's going to end? At the bottom of a lake? We risk everything for you. We've been criticized for you. We've been isolated for you. We've been ostracized for you. Our friends have talked about us. Our family have called us a fool. Is this how how it all ends in the lake in a storm they underestimated Jesus they didn't ask him to do anything because they didn't believe that he could and somebody better hear me today because I want to caution you my dear friends assembled in this place don't doubt the Lord when you're going through a storm because Jesus can be trusted even when the storm is raging I knew I'd have a few witnesses there. This is a critical issue in our moments of challenge. It was a pivotal concern for the disciples traveling across the lake that day. It was a critical question for the first listeners to Mark's gospel in Rome undergoing incredible persecution. It's an important question for you and me right now with bills to pay, with kids to raise, with jobs to handle, with enemies to to negotiate as we watch others go through the storm and as we encounter our own storm the question becomes do you really believe that the Lord can handle whatever you face or have you underestimated him because permit me to say it again Jesus can be trusted even when the storms are raging he doesn't have to move or respond or react when you want how you want and the way you want but if he doesn't that don't mean he can't preach brother amen he doesn't have to move or respond or react in the way that you want how you want when you want because hear me well there are no emergencies with the Lord you got to grab that one. Wait, there are emergencies for you and there are emergencies for me. 
There are things that catch you off guard and things that catch me off guard. But there's nothing that catches the Lord off guard. He sees the end from the very beginning. He knows how it's going to end up before it ever start up. So there's no emergencies with the Lord. He knows what he can do. He knows what he will do. And until he does what he wants to do, we have no choice but to wait and to see what he's going to do. I need an old church mother right here to testify that you can't hurry God. You just have to wait. Trust in him and give him time no matter how long it takes. He's a God that you just can't hurry, but he'll be there. Don't worry. He may not come when you want him, but he's always on time because he's an on time God. Yes, he is. See, the primary point of this pericope peeks at us from verse 36. It's so subtle, it's easy to miss it because this story is ultimately not about the storm, nor is it about the ship. It's not about whether there is a storm in your life, but the whole point of this pericope is whether or not Jesus is on your boat. Okay, wait, wait, let me read verse 36. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were other, in the King James Version, which is in your bulletin, it says there were other little boats traveling alongside of them. They took them along as well. That's my advice for some would-be sailor on the sea of life today. Make sure that whatever else and whoever else you take as you adventure in the opportunities, as you ferry into your future as you sail towards your tomorrow make sure that whatever else you take and whoever else you take you take Jesus along there were some ships sailing near them that didn't have him on board but make sure my friend that whatever else you take and whoever else you take that you take Jesus on your boat take him along because if Jesus is on board the ship may shake but it will not never sink. If Jesus is on board, the storm may rise, but you'll get through it. If Jesus is on board, people may doubt, but he will deliver. Amy Carmichael wrote, Thou art the Lord who slept upon the pillow. Thou art the Lord who soothed the furious sea. What matter beating wind and tossing billow if we are on the boat with thee? Take him along because as they did, they moved beyond the chaotic incident, still with the calm instruction to a confident conclusion because they were not alone in the chaos. Jesus was there with them. It's important for us to note that because how does Jesus respond real quick? First of all, he speaks to the storm. Now, I know I haven't asked you to tell your neighbor nothing, but tell him this. Say, neighbor, the Lord's got a word for your storm. See, the, the Bible says, it's right there in the text, that he got up, he rebuked the wind, he said to the waves, quiet, be still and then the wind died down and it was completely calm he had laid down to sleep in his humanity but he stood up to speak in his divinity quiet be still. Jesus deals with the real battle here. The language used in the Greek is very deliberate. It's the same language used at Mark 125 when Jesus was dealing with a demonic presence. He understood that he was dealing with more than just weather here, that there was a spiritual battle at play. And the disciples weren't fully aware of the power that Jesus had to deal with their greatest fear their biggest storm, all of the cultural baggage that they had brought along that said the lake and the river and the seas and the oceans could be mean and agents of the demonic. Jesus knew that it was guarded, difficult territory, fraught with confusion and misunderstanding, but he also knew his power was greater than their fear. His power was greater than their anxiety. His power was greater than what they faced. When fear began 
began to devour the disciples when they were drowned by their worries and swamped by their anxieties Jesus spoke a word that was stronger mightier and greater he speaks to their storm. When I, I'm a child of the church and when I was coming up as a boy, the old people had a song that they would sing every now and then called Blessed Quietness. Holy Quiet, I can see y'all know, amen. Ble Holy Quietness, what assurance in my soul. And the second chorus said, on the stormy sea, Jesus speaks to me and the billows cease to roll. The, the first thing that he did was speak to their storm but notice the second thing he does is deal with the disciples he asked them why are you so afraid do you still have no faith now in the Greek language from which the English is derived the phrase is actually rendered like this this is the moment to take the faith I've given you and put it to work Y'all ain't ready, amen. See, that is one thing to have faith. It's another thing for faith to have you. It's another one thing to possess your faith. It's another thing to work your faith. Because everybody talking about faith ain't got no faith. But it's not until the storm breaks out. See, on one level, it's real clear why they were afraid. They were about to drown. But Jesus asked the question, follow me, not because he doesn't know the answer. He asked the question in the rabbinical tradition where when a question was raised, it always pointed to a deeper issue. It would bring underlying concerns into the light of examination. When God raises a question with you, it's not because God needs the answer. God already knows the answer. God just wants you to realize the answer. When God was walking in the Genesis narrative through the Garden of Eden and said, Adam, where are you? God wasn't lost. He didn't need GPS. He, he didn't have any problem tracking Adam down. He was trying to get Adam to see where Adam was. A Adam identified his existential situation. He said, I'm naked. And I'm hiding over here in the bushes. And God immediately knew. He said, who told you you was naked? Boy, that's a sermon all by itself. Look, when God raises a question, he's not trying to get an answer. He's trying to get you to realize the answer to the question that he raised. He asked this question because Jesus knew he was more powerful than the elements. He asked this question because he had been sent from Almighty God. He asked this question because he is the Lord. He is the Savior. He is the master of earth, ocean, sky, and sea. He is Alpha. He he is Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the first. He is the last. He is all you need whenever you need it, however you require it. But they did not see it. But also he asked this question because at the very onset, and I know it slipped by you in terms of the way that I read it, he had told them, let us go over to the other side. He did not say, let's go to the middle. You ain't ready. He said, let us go over to the other side. Whenever, boy, this is worth writing down. Whenever the Lord wants to take you to something, he first permits you to go through something. We go Wait, the Christian faith is about going through. Somebody should open your mouth in faith right there and just say to your life, I'm going through. Amen. I, I'm not going to stop here. This is not going to kill me. My present situation ain't going to take me out. I am a child of God. I'm going through. See, we go through pain to get to progress. We go through the curriculum to get the degree and the diploma.
preach, brother. We go through distress to get to deliverance. We go through the valley of the shadow of death to get to assurance. We go through hurt to get to healing, through struggle to get strong, through a test to get a testimony, through a mess to get a message, through weeping to get to joy, through death to get to resurrection. And so his question to us is, can you trust the word I gave you? Can you believe that if I'm calm in your storm? Wait, because what was Jesus doing? Come on, come on. What was Jesus doing? If I'm calm in your storm, can you believe that I got it? And I got you. Wait, wait, y'all ain't ready. I fly a lot, unapologetically. I fly a lot. And every now and then, with great frequency, we run into turbulence. Now, you can always tell inexperienced flyers when turbulence comes. Because they immediately... You can tell an experienced flyer, right? Because they look at the flight attendants. Y- y'all missing it, amen. An experienced flyer looks at the flight attendants. As long as they still serve and drinks. <laughs> Bringing them little biscuit cookies, nip Cheetos, we all right. It's a little bumpy. Somebody asked me, they said, don't you ever get nervous when there's turbulence? I said, no. They said, why? I said, let me tell you what would make me nervous if I was on a plane. If we ran into turbulence and the captain came over the intercom intercom, and said, woo! I said, then I'm going to be nervous. But as long as the captain comes over the intercom, and says, ladies and gentlemen, we're flying at 30,000 feet. We've run into a little turbulence here, but I want you to keep your seatbelt on. Observe the fastened seatbelt sign because I'm gonna go up a little higher. Y'all don't hear me. The question is, can you trust the word I gave you? God is stronger than your storm. God is greater than your fears. God is mightier than your enemies. And Jesus questions, there are challenges for us. Because we often ask the question, especially when we read this story, how long is it going to take for Jesus to fix it? When the real question is, how long are you going to wait before you go wake Jesus up? Y'all miss that, see, because sometimes it might appear that he's sleeping because he's waiting for you to get enough faith to recognize you can't do it on your own and holler out, Lord, I need you. I, I heard one preacher say, don't doubt in the dark what you heard in the light. What did you hear before you got in the lake? Before you got in the storm, before things went crazy, before your kids lost their mind, before your job let you go, before things fell apart, don't doubt in the dark what you heard in the light. Maybe, maybe, think about it, maybe the Lord sent you to that job where you're being underpaid, underappreciated, misunderstood, mishandled, and disrespected. Can't find your peace, can't get your raise, can't get a positive review. Maybe God sent you there because heaven needs a witness. Y'all ain't ready, amen. See, see, we think that God gets the glory when everything is well with us. No, when you are doing really bad, if you make God look really good, God gets the glory because those who are watching you go through 
will say, how in the hell are you going through that hell that you going through? And you can tell them nobody but the Lord. Don't doubt in the dark what you heard in the light because the Lord is with you. He calmed the storm. The disciples, the Bible says, were terrified a second time. But this time it's a different kind of fear. It's not despair. It's not desperation. Watch what happens. It is awe and reverence. Verse 41, the disciples say, let me do the old school version. What manner of man is this? that even the winds and the waters obey his voice. This is subtle, but I don't want you to miss it. It's after the storm that they recognize who he is. It's after the storm that they get a fresh revelation of his goodness. It's after the storm that they realize he's able to handle you coming into the storm, going through the storm, and coming out. They saw for themselves that he rescues lives. He changes outcomes. He alters future. He transforms situation. What manner of man is this? Because if Jesus can command winds and waves, what is it in your life, my friend, that he cannot fix? There's no burden he can't lift. There's no door he can't open. There's no way he can't make. There's no enemy he cannot defeat. There's no need he cannot meet. There's no problem he cannot solve. There's no sickness he cannot heal. There's no sin he cannot forgive. And there's no soul he cannot save. The storm was mighty, but he is almighty. The storm is fierce, but he is ever faithful. The old people used to say God never fails just keep the faith that never seems to break just walk upright morning noon day or night he'll be there I said he'll be there there's no need to worry because God never fails God can fix anything God can fix everything if it's a heartache he can handle it if it's a battle he can fight it if it's a storm he can come Comment. So I've got a word for you today. Let Jesus fix it for you. He knows what to do. Whenever you pray, let him have his way. And he will. I said he will fix it for you. Because the good news of the text is that just like he said, they made it to the other side. The storm was rough, but they made it to the other side. Look at your neighbor one last time and say, neighbor, I prophesy that you going to make it to the other side. Yes, you will. Look at him one more time. Say, go on, get over it. Because God never said that the way would be easy. God never said that you wouldn't be attacked. God never said that people wouldn't stab you in your back or betray you or lie on you. God never said that your heart wouldn't be broken and that you wouldn't have to cry yourself to sleep. The storm may be rough, but get over it. Whatever it is, get over it. Whoever it is, get over it. Your destiny depends on it. You can't can't quit. You can't drown. You can't surrender. You can't give up. There's something waiting on you on the other side. I know you're going to make it. Because I know you're in the middle of a storm, but you're going to make it somehow. Look at your neighbor. You don't even have to touch them. You ain't got to shake their hand. You ain't got to rock them at all. Just let let your voice do the work. Say, neighbor, you can't go under because there's a blessing on the other side. Ask them the question. Say, do you believe?
believe it can you receive it then don't let go don't stop don't quit don't give up God will see you through won't he do it yes he will yes he will Stand with me. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Where in your life are you underestimating the Lord? You have a tacit intellectual belief. Yeah, I believe God can. But in your heart, you don't believe God will. And the reason you can know you really don't believe it is you haven't acted on it. Because what we really believe, we act on. Your behavior demonstrates your belief. You believe fire will burn you, so you don't put your hand in it. Your behavior demonstrates your belief. All of us underestimate the Lord. We say we believe, but we don't stretch out. When the storm comes, we panic rather than pray. And God is giving us the opportunity today to take the faith we have and put it to work. To take the faith he's given us and make it work in our circumstance. Say to God, I'm stretching out on your will. If, if, you, if, if you don't deliver me, if you don't bring me out, I'm just not coming out. I'm stretching out on your will. God, in the name of Jesus, I pray for all of these, my brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, under the sound of my voice. I thank you for the faith that you have given us. And we pray now for an increase and our ability to believe. Lord, show us who you are. If you gotta take us through a storm to do it, show us who you are so that we too might marvel what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the waters obey his voice. We acknowledge that you are in charge. You are on the throne. You are the Lord all by yourself. And at the calling of your name, every knee must bow. And every tongue must confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. So bless us, Lord, that we might be drawn closer, that we might be made stronger in the name of Jesus. And all the people said, hallelujah. Talk to your neighbor for a moment. Say, neighbor, the question of the day ought to be clear now. Is Jesus on your boat? Look at him. Say, he can be. Look, look at him one more time. Say, he can be. And that's my invitation to you, my brother, my sister, as the choir sings and the whole church prays. I want to invite you to get Jesus aboard the boat of your life as you adventure forward into your future. You ain't living until you meet the master. You'll never be all you can be without the Lord on your boat. Because no matter who you are, all of us will run in the storms that we cannot manage all by ourselves. And in that moment, when the storm breaks out, you're going to need a savior. I've got a recommendation for you today. His name is Jesus Christ. He calms winds and waters. He makes seas be still. And if he can handle the wind and the water, he can handle whatever you're going through. But you've got to put your trust in him. Come on, celebrate. My brother and my sister, give praise to God for them. There are others. Come on, make this your day. Give God a chance. We welcome you. We welcome you.
Welcome. Welcome. And to your way. I'll say yes. I'll say yes. Lord. I'll trust you. I will trust you. And no when way. your spirit. When your spirit. Speaks to me. Come on, give God a chance. I see you, my sisters, my brothers. Welcome. Make this your day. Welcome, my brother. Hallelujah. Somebody praise God with me. Praise God with me. Welcome. To your will. To your will. Welcome. Welcome. Praise God. Welcome. Welcome. Glory to God. Welcome, my brothers. Hallelujah. Welcome. With my whole heart. With my whole heart. And my Get Jesus on your boat. Come on out. I'll, I'll say, say yes. yes. I'll say yes. Lord. Lord. Lord, yes. To your will. To your way. I'll say yes. Lord, yes. Trust you and obey when your, when your spirit, spirit. And with my whole heart I'll agree and, and my answer will be yes. Come on, say it one more time. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will. trust you and when your spirit speaks and on for all of those who came help me praise God you may be seated very quickly let me share with you as we prepare to worship God through the giving of our tithe and our offering. And remember today we are walking around. This is our act of benediction. But as we prepare for that, can I ask you to take out the bulletins that you have been provided? Let me give you a few highlights, brothers and sisters, starting with the front of the bulletin. Our bookstore, Charisma, has products on sale an overstock CD, DVD sale going on. They are right outside the door today. Should you care to stop in and to support them? In addition to that, how many of you have children in college or you are in college yourself? Just wave at me if I'm talking to you. We are in the period of scholarship applications. Our community foundation is taking scholarship applications and that information is on the inside cover of your bulletin. Please pay attention to it because the deadlines are strict deadlines. The requirements are strict requirements because there are only going to be so many awards. But I wanted to make sure that you knew about it in enough time to be able to apply if it applies to you. We are committed to helping men and women achieve their goals in higher education and we do it through our scholarship fund. In addition to that, right under that announcement, you see an announcement for Blackout RVA. It is our first business networking event of the year. So I'm calling all of our business professionals, business owners, entrepreneurs, those who are dreaming of having your own business to join us on Thursday, April the 16th at 7 o'clock in the place of our regular Bible study in the commons for Blackout RVA. The event is described in the announcement in the bulletin. We would love to have you, but we do need you to register. It is free. There's no bait and switch. It is a free event, but because we are serving free food, those are two good words, free food, especially when they're put together, free food, because we're having free food, we need to get a good head count to know how much food needs to be prepared. So they are registering today out at the kiosk after the service. You can stop by. They'll register you 
or you can register online with the information provided in the bulletin. The very next week on April the 23rd, as the front cover of your bulletin portrays, we are sponsoring a showcase of St. Paul's Baptist Church authors, artists, and bakers in an event called Books, Beats, and Sweets. And so we're going to showcase several of our authors who have written books. They'll be talking about that process, the purpose behind their publication, etc. Several artists will be performing who are part of St. Paul's. And several of our bakers have already come online. And they're going to be providing samples of their baked goods. And if you didn't know it, especially if you're a visitor, there are people in St. Paul's who can cook. Wait, no, no, no. Okay, take a good look at me, right? I'm a, I'm a little portly. I used to be 150 pounds before I started fooling around with y'all. Amen. <laughs> no, no, but they can cook, they can bake. And we want you to be blessed by their gift. It's going to be on April the 23rd. Say the magic word with me. Everybody say free. free. Okay, it is also a free event. But you do need to register so that we can prepare for your arrival. On April the 9th, which is before, uh, of course, topping off the month, we will all be going over to the Belt Campus for our Monday, Thursday commemoration during Holy Week. That's the day before Good Friday on April the 9th. That night, Monday, Thursday, commemorates the night where Jesus, knowing that he was going to be crucified, washed his disciples' feet as an example of servanthood to all of us who would follow him in the body of Christ. It is our Holy Week commemoration, and so we want to invite you to mark that on your calendar and plan to share with us in that experience and then finally as we get ready to worship through our giving uh, I am honored and humbled and privileged because this is a rare exception to have been invited this year to be the uh, main preacher for the Richmond citywide revival <laughs> glory be to God praise be to God it begins tomorrow night through Wednesday at the Cedar Street Memorial Church of God and it would be a joy to see your face in the place. It, where's Joyce? She's not here today. Okay, she's gone. She directs the choir. At, one of our members is directing the choir for the citywide revival. So it's going to be a St. Paul's flavor in the house. And I hope that you'll be there to share with us in this time of revival. Because our city and our region, our country is in need of a revival in the midst of all that's going on we the people of god need to be revived and reminded in the storm of who the lord is let's prepare to worship god through our giving if you'd like to give digitally you can text the letters spbc cre to 77977 and follow the prompts it's easy it's safe it's convenient and it's repeatable it is your pastor's favorite way of giving because it is so easy if you'd like to give old school we welcome your gifts and encourage you to use an envelope we're going to march around today to share our gifts this is our act of benediction but first would you stand all over the building and let me bless you Oh, wait, wait, wait. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would be so remiss if I let us dismiss this service without honoring all of our Girl Scouts, Brownie Scouts. No, give them a great big applause. We welcome you and we congratulate you. We commend all of you young ladies to the work. Girl Scouting is a fabulous work that's going to help to build character and faith and competence in you. You are looking at, you are looking at a former Cub Scout. You are looking at a former Bobcat, a former Weebelow. 
I know y'all ain't know what that is, do you? But uh, it's, it's the Boy Scout version of Girl Scouts. But I am grateful to God for the ministry of our Girl Scouts and our Boy Scouts, for all of the parents and sponsors who participate and support them. Give them one more big hand, if you will. As we go out today, our good friend, Congressman Donald McEachin has his team out in the atrium. They are collecting signatures to make sure that his name is on the ballot again in November. He has done a wonderful job for our community, fighting the fight of social justice and seeking to make change in the United States legislature. So please stop by their kiosk and be supportive of him. Would you just lift your right hand wherever you are? Lord, our right hand is lifted, not of our own accord, not of our own power, but out of our desire to reach out to you. So see now, oh God, your people with their hand lifted and bless them at the point of their need. Our needs are varied, our needs are diverse, our needs are complicated. But we thank you that you are more than able to bless every one of us at the same time. So now over your people, I pray your blessing this week. That you would bless them coming in, bless them going out, bless them rising up, bless them when they lay down, bless them in their labor and their leisure, their laughter and their tears in the name of Jesus. And all the people said hallelujah and amen starting with the last row could i get all of you to turn to your right my left turn to your right and starting with the last row if you'd be so kind as to follow the instruction of the ushers come right down that aisle right in front of you share your gift and continue walking to the left and exit out of the first row you get to after you have shared your gift may god bless you richly in the name of Jesus, as you live your life this week, go in peace and the Lord go with you. Oh,